uh, to be um, asked to, to chair a closing plenary um, for what's been a fantastic uh, Alt Online Summer Summit. Um, so much to think about, um, so much to take away, and I think these discussions will, will resonate for, for a long time to come. Slightly daunting prospect uh, to chair the closing plenary after um, our closing plenary yesterday um, in the hands of the Gasta legend Tom Farrelly. Um, but I think we've got a very appropriate end to the conference. Um, we've got a great panel um, of speakers uh, lined up to lead us through the topic you see on the screen, learning technology beyond the crisis, policies for a sustainable future. So we're extremely honored to be uh, joined by Mary, Laura, Anne-Marie and Ian. Um, we have an overarching question, um, which will frame the discussions for our panel. Uh, session for the next month. Um, how could the experiences and lessons from the pandemic so far uh, usefully change policies to ensure a better post-secondary education, education system going forward? Now we're going to approach the panel um, uh, uh, in a particular way. Um, we're going to be looking at the implications of this question in relation to institutional policy and then national policy and then international policy. So we will invite each of the panel members to give their view on this question in relation to each of those policy levels. And once we've considered um, each policy level, we will pause for some uh, delegate participation. Um, so if you would like to take the mic um, when we pause for questions, please put up your hand and that will give us the order in which we will hand the mic to people. And similarly, please feel free to ask questions in the chat area. If you have a question for the panel, rather than uh, things you're discussing yourselves, please put the letter Q uh, in front of your questions so that we know that it's a question for the panel. Um, and we will take things from there and we will see how far we get um, uh, over the next 50 odd minutes. So how could experiences and lessons learned from the pandemic so far usefully change policy to ensure a better post-secondary education system? Um, the first level of policy we're going to consider is institutional. Um, I'm going to hand to Mary, first of all, uh, to give us um, a couple of minutes on her thoughts on this question in relation to institutional policy. So Mary, over to you, please. Thank you so much and good morning, everybody. I'm coming to you this morning from the traditional unceded territories of the Lungan speaking people, also known as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations here on Vancouver Island in uh, Victoria, British Columbia. Um, it's been obviously interesting for all of us, this whole uh, pandemic, and um, we have, uh, I think for many of us who've been working in this field for a long time, it's been um, a confirmation of things that we knew in our gut, but um, that we didn't have all the evidence we needed to know, and that is that educators were really unprepared to teach online and teach with technology. Um, and further to that, I think what we, at, at BC Campus, we've been working a lot with the notion of who are we leaving out um, in education. And this, uh, again, the pandemic has really highlighted those gaps in education uh, where we really haven't prepared educators well to manage relationships individually with students. And so I think that's really for me um, and, and I struggle with, with policy around here, with, with using policy to um, mandate um, people's behaviors. And so I think it's as much as it's policy, um, it's culture. And I don't know if we can change culture with policy, um, but I certainly think that we need to do some different um, things around how we prepare educators for having a relationship with students and how we support those relationships. Um, one of the things I've seen that's been the most disturbing, but again, not a huge surprise, is the lack of trust that uh, educators have in their students. Um, the, the whole notion of, um, um, of plagiarism, of students cheating on exams, um, all of those things have really uh, created a situation that means that students are uh, having their privacy invaded in order to have exams proctored. Um, they're having to use technologies that um, aren't well supported. Uh, and so I think I think we really uh, have some work to do, as I say, around relationship building um, and uh, and helping educators um, build relationships um, that include trust with their students. And so um, 
I think some of that as well as some work around obviously uh, at a more practical level digital literacy um, are, are a couple of the places that we really need to go at the institutional level. Great, thank you very much, Mary. And um, uh, what you're saying immediately resonating with everyone, and particularly the point around um, who are we leaving out. So I'm sure we'll come back to, to many of these things. Um, Laura, if we can invite you to give um, your perspective on our, our question in relation to institutional policy, please. Sure. So, you know, the question of uh, beyond pandemic makes me want to start talking about exciting, creative, imaginative futures. But I'm very mindful, and it's been commented on often in this event, how absolutely exhausted we are. Everyone, everyone in the sector, everyone in society, everyone whose families have lost jobs. And so what I actually think we need to be thinking about is how we can leverage um, short-term gains, short-term strategic gains for the longer term. Um, because what we have seen is changes that we've managed to make during this period, and Mary's already touched on it, that we would want to take forward. So I just want to tell you what I understand by policy. Of course, Mary's right, it's, part, it's deeply um, located in, in, in culture, but I misremember a definition of, of policy that I really like, and that is that policy is the allocation of values and resources. And so when I'm talking about policy, I'm talking about how those values were allocated in foreground and the associated resources, financial capacity and so on have been allocated. And what we have seen during this period is things we knew before and they've been brought right to the fore, which is around inequality in South Africa that was under the hashtag no student left behind. And in the legislative um, sphere that was around a multimodal approach, so including the digital and, and print. And I've heard that in so many different sectors uh, across the world around vulnerable students, about students with barriers to learning. And I think that that focus is something that one will, we will want to entrench in policies going forward. I've also seen that there's been a commitment to stabilizing and strengthening certain parts of the workforce. I'm not talking about all the, the, um, the, the, the teaching staff who've lost their jobs. I'm talking about the learning designers who've been on short-term contracts, which Melissa was talking about yesterday. And suddenly money was found to uh, extend their contracts and to put them in permanent positions. So that's what I mean about the allocation of resources. And I, I don't know about you, but in my very traditional university, HR processes are deeply bureaucratic, lengthy and complicated. And in this particular situation, we were able to move fast, make things happen, um, adjust and push the envelope. And those are the kinds of things that I would like to see going forward. So the kind of reorganizing and making things happen, um, I think, is the the, the the um, work that has happened during this pandemic at the national level. And it's also been a time where incentives have been put in place to recognize the kind of good work that's happened, especially um, planning for the most disadvantaged in, in multiple ways that have come up during this conference. So I think I'll, I'll stop at that point. Um, and I'm sure others will pick up related points. Thank you, Laura. And I think, again, you know, resonating with uh, um, colleagues in the, the chat area, uh, I think particularly a striking point around how responsive policy is and how can we ensure policy that's responsive, responsive enough to tackle precarity and the, the type of the, the, the nature of the precarity that we're in at the moment. Um, so thank you for that. I'm sure we're going to come back to that. Ian, can we invite your thoughts um, on the, the institutional policy level, please? Sure. Thanks, Keith. Um... I'm in golf, and I should explain perhaps I'm the odd person out here and I don't work in an institution. I work for a consortium of institutions which collaborate institu uh, internationally to produce open source software. So there might be an element of he would say that, wouldn't he, about this. But I want to focus on a, on a couple of relatively narrow areas, small pieces of the jigsaw, about how institutions acquire software and some concerns about privacy. Uh, which have surfaced over the course of the last two days, a great couple of days, by the way. So, I mean, I think we've seen 
a good many commercial proprietary software vendors in higher education space offer sweetheart licensing deals in the initial stages of the pandemic as institutions moved and responded rapidly to move online. How long those licensing deals are going to remain, uh, sweetheart, remains to be seen. And eventually, my fear is that a cost is going to have to be passed on. Um, it strikes me that we need to review at an institutional level the processes and, and policies by which institutions acquire and maintain software and software services. And you'll notice I didn't use the word procure or procurement in that sentence because often procurement processes themselves rule out open alternatives. It's interesting in the conversation this morning in, in Charlotte's session, some of these points were, were being reached to. But I also think at something above the institutional level, there's a question about how we deploy and support open software. And Melissa Hyten's comments in yesterday's opening panel were very interesting, especially when she described the sense of emerging solidarity between institutions in Edinburgh. And I'd be interested to see from, from the, the folks in the virtual room here how far that's reflected elsewhere. But it'll also be interesting to see how far that solidarity develops and matures, because I think there are some genuine opportunities for collaboration between institutions that may open up uh, and they're going to pose policy challenges. But I think there's an, an opportunity there which people may well seize. I'll make some comments about privacy later on because I think I've spoken enough about that. Thank you, Ian. And um, yeah, I think um, there's this whole notion around um, uh, the nature of a collective response and a way forward for a collective response, um, I think is marked nicely by the fact that we're having this event. And I'm sure, I'm sure it's something we'll come back to and maybe some of the examples from Melissa's experience at Edinburgh. Um, Anne-Marie, can we invite you to give your thoughts on the institutional level, please? Yes, sure. Um, and thank you, everybody, for having me here this morning. Uh, I think most of you, or a large number of you, will, will know me. And the accent um, will probably throw you. I used to work at the University of Edinburgh, but I now work for Athabasca University in Canada. Um, and like Mary, I live on land that uh, belongs to other people. So I just like to know that I live and work and I'm very well cared for in this pandemic on land that belongs traditionally to the Cree, the Sotho, the Dakota Sioux, the Blackfoot and the Métis. And that's incredibly important in this moment because some of the communities here in Canada, this concept of, of not being left behind, are choosing for their own safety and protection to isolate themselves and that's giving us a particular challenge at this point in time because in some of the places and spaces they're choosing to be safe so there's not good connectivity um, so i think there are there are some institutional responses um, that address that but we'll probably get on to some of that in in the national space as well um, and I'm, I'm sure that will uh, look similar in, in south africa and also in the uk but I think there's, there's one key point before I pick on a couple of institutional pieces that I'd like to draw out. Uh, and you, you sort of made it already there, Keith, which was the speed with which we have as a sector been able to pivot um, and the response, the collective response that we marshaled shows that we are not broken as a sector and we are very capable of dealing with disruption. We're tired. <laughs> There's no question that we're tired. But I think that's an incredibly important point because for many, many years now, we've been told that HE and, and post-secondary education is broken and that it needs disrupted. Well, it got disrupted and look what we managed to achieve. But if I, if I go back to, to Laura's points about you know, what the short-term gains that we want to now solidify um, and see strategically, I couldn't agree with I couldn't agree with more with the, the various points that other speakers have made. Um, but to add to those, I, I would say that on the digital literacy piece, there's a level of investment in the colleagues and the students who work with us in our institutions. But I think there's also, I hope, an acknowledgement that we need a level of digital literacy and senior leadership as well. That the ability to pivot um, was was very much in, in some institutions dependent on the, the existing management structures that were there and the strategic investments that have been made over time in technology. So having good digital literacy right through the senior management team is, is incredibly important. The other thing I think is that 
understanding that treating all students equally doesn't mean doing the same thing for all students and, and this is you know where, where policy comes into play because I think sometimes we're a little scared that we may be treating students unfairly. So using policy as an enabler to allow people flexibility um, and using policy as a permissive tool, I think, is, in, is incredibly important. And that can manifest in lots of different ways. That might manifest in policies around care. That might manifest in policies around academic integrity, assessment. But that fundamental point about policy as a permissive tool to enable some of the change we want to see, um, I think, is, is important. And the process of developing policy can be that process of culture change that, that Mary alluded to as well. I'm not suggesting policy is a magic bullet either, though. Um, one other key point, I think, though, is that our, our institutions are, are silos. I don't know how many website redesign projects I've seen over the years that try to break the institutional silo. But to me, it's very clear that we still have some problems um, between the kind of academic and the administrative side of institutions. And we need to think about how we better embed health and well-being resources into students' learning lives. So how can we how can we close out some of those gaps so when our students do need help, it's quicker and easier for them to find that help. And that could be mental health support, that could be disability support. But we know in this pandemic that all of these um, all of these areas of support and that can lead to inequity um, have been exacerbated. Um, and their impact is, is so much greater. So being able to signpost and more quickly move to those things and really break those institutional silos is important. I could go Great, on forever. Thank you, Anne Marie. <laughs> No, that, that's fantastic. Lots for us to think about there. And um, uh, a lot of what you're saying uh, has, has kind of resonated for me in terms of other sessions I've been, we've been in where there's been discussion about digital literacies in relation to wellbeing and the fact that we have students who haven't self-selected to study fully or predominantly online. And as, in addition to digital literacies, an important part of that well-being is a sense of belonging and ensuring there's opportunities for social belonging. So I'm sure some of these things we may be able to tease out as well. Um, I'm going to pause there and just um, invite any of our participants who would like to um, to take the mic if they would like to ask a question. And we will ask you to click on the raised hand icon if you would like to take the mic. Uh, and we'll also pause for a moment to see if there are any questions in the chat area. I've not seen any that have been um, uh, prefixed with the queue, um, which would indicate the questions directly to the panel. But I'm just going to have a quick look just now. I don't think so. But what I will do um, while we, we keep talking, I will invite um, uh, the panel members um, uh, to look down the comments and see if there's anything in particular they'd like to pull out. Um, before we move on. Um, but picking up on uh, Anne-Marie's um, points and reference back to May's um, opening question, um, can we change culture with policy? Um, Mary, you asked that question, but I um, uh, didn't have the opportunity to articulate whether um, uh, that might be possible. So can we bounce that one back to you just while we see whether there's any other questions coming in? Um, yeah. Do you think we can change culture with policy, Mary? I think it's one of the tools that you can use to change culture. We haven't used policy a lot. Just so folks know, if you're not familiar with BC Campus, we're a group that serves and supports all of the public post-secondary institutions in British Columbia, of which there are 25, all the way from big institutions like the University of British Columbia to very small uh, community colleges. and. And so it's hard to enact policy across a system that's that diverse. But I do think that uh, one of the things that we've done at BC campus to sort of drive culture around open education, for example, is that we require collaboration between institutions who are going to be given grants um, for open education projects. And that's something that we've worked with government a lot with uh, on this as well. I don't know if you want me to jump into the second question. Um, it sort of leads from here. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I think I think we'll, we'll kind of um, move on to look at the, the broader context. We do have a question that's come into the chat room um, from Chris Morrison. Uh, is there an issue with policy development that people with policy responsibilities um, are often given a compliance type brief? So Mary, if we stick with you, um, if you'd like to um, do an initial response to this, and then we'll move to the rest of the panel um, to, to get their take on it. 
Sure. Yeah. And I, I assume you mean this is sort of back to the conversation about does a policy enable or does it put people in a box? And um, and I, I think for us, it's both right is is that we want people to think more broadly about how they're doing their work. And so we can use it to uh, expand the way that people um, work with each other. But it can also be used to say, no, you cannot do that if you're going to do this. So for example, we have um, not given money to um, white people who've wanted to write uh, textbooks about indigenous people. That's a policy that we have at BC campus that protects uh, oppressed people. And so we we use it in both ways, I would say, both to incentivize and to prevent things from happening that we don't want to have happen. Great, thank you. And then thanks for colleagues who um, are contributing to the response to this question in the chat area. Um, can I invite any of the other panel members who would like to, to respond to this question? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that one as well. And it picks up on a couple of the things that are in the chat, which is about the implementation of policy. Um, and I think that's where the rubber hits the road, absolutely. Um, and communicating it and being clear about how it's operationalized and thinking about how you can structurally operationalize it is really important. I worked on some principles for the ethical use of student personal data recently. That could be shelfware. Um, we've, we've thought about how we operationalize it. We've built it into our digital governance process. So new projects that are starting up have to engage with it as part of the startup process. So thinking about how you operationalize it is important. But underneath this, I think there is an issue um, that we need to, to talk about, which is the issue of trust within the, the institution. Policies very often see as belonging to the administrative side of the institution. Um, so I think there there is a, there is a piece in here around the communication and the, the ongoing um, operationalization of policy that has to address that that issue of trust there are a number of people in the institution who who you know believe policy is there to constrain them or policy is not made for them or by people like them and that's an ongoing project i think to to try and combat that mindset all the time as well great thank you Anne marie and colleagues are contributing other um factors that are enabling in relation to policy uh, and melissa picking up on the link between strategy and policy uh, and the need for policy to be supported by services, um, uh, presumably if, if they're going to be affected and affect change. Um, we did have a direct question for Laura from Amanda. Um, I'm not, not sure if you've seen that, Laura. Um, Amanda's saying that she's really interested in the definition you offered that policy is the allocation of values and resources. Are there any further readings you would suggest in this area? <laughs> so, you know, I read, I read that somewhere and then I claimed it as my own and then I thought I had better um, go and find the, the original source and then I discovered that I had actually um, changed it. So I can find the original source but actually it's, it's become the definition that I use because it speaks to the, the issues that I think are, are really important because policies really signal values and when we talk about international policies you know, the whole kind of question of the marketization of the entire sector in a kind of neoliberal order is, is, is the particular place that regulatory policies and frameworks that um, actually shape our entire societies are a signal of values. But I think the, the question of uh, that people have been talking about implementation is where the resources come into it because you can have a lot of really good policy signals but if you actually don't put the resources, the capacity, the governance, the infrastructure and the effort that goes into realizing those, they are meaningless. They're just signals. Um, so I'll, I'll dig up the original for you, Amanda. Thank Otherwise you, you much, Laura. me. Thank you. Um, to the colleagues who are responding and sharing things in the chat area. Um, a few folk um, came in um, as the session was underway. So I'm just going to let colleagues that join us a little later know that we are having a discussion around the experiences of the pandemic um, and how what that might mean in relation to changing policies to ensure a better post-education, post-secondary education system. Uh, and we're exploring um, policy at institutional, national and international level. And we're about to move on and hear the panel's thoughts on 
national policy implications um, of the pandemic. So, um, Laura, uh, if we go back to you, um, and we can ask you to keep on this one and give us your perspective on the national policy implications of this situation we have been in and are hoping to respond to going forward. Sure, I'm happy to do so. And before I start, um, I just want to respond to something in the chat from Teresa, who was saying how really important it is to try and capture what's happening, which is a really big ask at the moment, given how hard everyone's working and looking after kids and extended families and losing jobs and etc. So one of the ways that we've tried to do that in South Africa is we, we collaboratively put together a paper of our reflections. And I think Marin's going to put it up in the chat. So you'll get a sense of the sector through um, writing something together. And one of the things that became very clear writing, I think 16 universities in South Africa uh, we wrote together, is how the, how the stratification of the sector has become so explicit during this period with some people not even having started remote teaching months after others. So the kind of levels of disadvantage, not just at the individual level with students, but across universities themselves. And the question of whether universe, some universities will survive in the long term has been really important. So I love the quote where um, Arundhati Roy talks about how the pandemic has been an MRI that's exposed the social bones. I think it's been an MRI that's really exposed the social bones of higher education. But before, we, I don't want to get completely uh, desperate, there's been some really interesting and encouraging collaboration that's happened. Uh, and we all know how competitive institutions are. In some cases, it's been universities helping one another. So with exam venues where suddenly students are all over the place and they have to write invigilated exams or proctored exams in one place. So we've seen that level of, of um, assistance. But the main area, the main thing that we hear in South Africa is that the sector worked together to negotiate with the uh, cell phone providers for the telco companies to negotiate zero rating for students to access data for uh, what are called white list listed educational sites. And I don't think that would have been possible at an individual level. So students, there's a list of, a, a, of a, it must be a, a, a thousand sites by now that are all educational sites and students can access that um, on their mobile devices and I think that shows you what's possible and I think it provides a lot of opportunity for addressing that kind of monopoly that we see and that's encouraging and then I think at the higher education policy level there are also opportunities around pushing pushing the forms of provision because like so many places it's an incredibly bureaucratic process around what's online what's distance what's how the funding formula works and we've seen people once again uh, at the national level prepared to break that because it was necessary it has been necessary to keep the academic project going and it's an opportunity from a policy point of view to put in place new forms of credentials, new forms of uh, provision that are not just for the purposes of unbundling for the private sector and for, uh, you know, the way that, that the unbundling and new forms of provision have generally been playing out, but actually offer opportunities for addressing inequalities. So I have been Great. encouraged at the national level about what's possible. That's fantastic. That's Thank you, Laura. And uh, I think on the, the kind of whole kind of topic of breaking monopolies and then seeing what can be done kind of collaboratively and collectively, we're due to come to Ian next uh, to get his take on the national implications um, in relation to policy and the discussions at the moment. And Ian, you've actually put something uh, in the chat area too around uh, resilience networks. Um, can we pass to you to pick up on this, please? Sure, the resilience network point was a, a relatively small one, but there are efforts in the, in the United States for sharing institutional experiences of the pandemic that I think it, it's worthwhile following through on and, and posting can go and, and search for that or I can pull some links out and pass them to, to Marin. 
Uh, I think one of the concerns I have at a national level um, is the has been raised several times in the last few days. And there's a danger in any situation such as the one we face that basic safeguards around privacy might be set aside or, or sidelined. There are, there are privacy concerns I know around data collected by, by the major platform providers and what that data might be used for. And I think that connects very directly with the topic of yesterday afternoon's keynote with Angela Sony that Charlotte White have amplified this morning. How do we better expose the fact of algorithmic bias? And this actually, I think, speaks to both institutional and national level. The A-level results chaos in England has opened a few eyes uh, in the UK, I hope, and has already had some impact on local government use of algorithms. I don't know whether folks saw the press reports earlier in the week about local government at least pausing their use of algorithms to help determine welfare and benefit benefit provision. So it strikes me that we've got an opportunity here at a national level to, to push against this opening door a little more, that we should be demanding as a minimum that algorithms and the code that surrounds them are open to meaningful inspection and interrogation. I think the calls for algorithmic accountability should be a principle, but at present they're also a useful tactic. And there may be a role, a very specific role for some of our colleagues in computer science here, but that's an area that I wanted to pick out that I think is a thread, it's a thread that's run through the last two days that I think we need to do further work on and we need to do further work collectively at the national level on. Great, thank you, Ian. And that whole theme of computer science and, and uh, uh, striving for unbiased and ethical computer science, I think, is one that has kind of resonated very strongly um, over the last couple of days. Um, remind colleagues, if you do have any questions for the panel, please post them into the chat area, but with the, the letter Q in front of it, so we know that it's a question for the panel. Um, Anne-Marie, um, we're due to come to you next on um, the national implications. Um, share your thoughts, please. Sure. Sure. So I, I should say, um, and Mary can speak eloquently to this as well, the, the situation here in Canada is a little different. It actually may be more like the UK than people give it credit for. Um, education, post-secondary education is regulated at the provincial level. So maybe not unlike Scotland and England having different education systems. Uh, the scale is a little different. <laughs> the scale of everything in Canada is a little different. Um, I've only been in the country for, for seven months and I'm still getting my head around how the, the provincial and the federal pieces work. Uh, but the one thing I would say, and this it touches very strongly on what Laura said as well, is that the the inequities in digital provision and digital infrastructure across the country have been have been written large and touched on this a little bit earlier with communities who choose to you know to choose to isolate themselves a little bit more but the cost data plans in Canada the extent to which high quality infrastructure has been rolled out across the country and the vast distances are, are an issue there but um, that the, that has proven to be very challenging and what's become really clear is the number of students who relied on what we call community broadband or community internet access. They would work in their local Starbucks or, or what is more call, not uncommon anyway, is driving to somewhere within reach of an internet signal or sitting and working in your car and, and there are you know, there are even institutions to build good parking lots, that kind of provision in the north of the country. So I think one of the things that's that's coming up and it's 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 true for education, but I think it's it's true for the country as a whole because business is required is, is reliant on the same infrastructure, is the extent to which national infrastructure to support online in lots of different contexts um, is not you know, it, it, the, the infrastructure isn't good enough yet um, and, and lays bare those inequities that, that Laura mentioned. Great, thank you Anne-Marie and I know that will resonate yeah. with um, a number of colleagues here, particularly those of us that are um, uh, in the Highlands of Scotland um, and we can relate very much to those challenges around infrastructure. Uh, I was on um, and in Scotland as well. <laughs> It, it's difficult and I think you know um, it, it becomes then really important to ask ourselves is the college or the university located and co-located what where are digital rich spaces that our students can can get to, to get access to us and to each other um, we have a question from Karen but just before we move to that um, uh, if we can go back to Mary who's not had a chance to talk about the national context yet so 
um, back to you, Mary. And then I think we will take Karen's question and see who in the panel would like to respond to that. Yeah, you bet. Um, just actually in response to Karen's question quickly, I think the first way to do that is to include people of color in the design. Um, and that I think has been one of the biggest issues is that we don't have diversity in software development teams and that's causing us uh, problems on the other end of that software. Um, as Anne-Marie said, uh, education is provincial, although that's one of the things that's happened during the pandemic is that the federal government has actually given more money to the provinces than they traditionally um, for, and, and, and there's been a little bit more collaboration there. And I, I think um, to pick up on what Laura was saying, collaboration is really um, the, the key here for us. And it's, it's how we've gotten work done at BC campus for many years. But one of the new things that we're doing um, is a project where we're developing open educational resources across the system uh, for courses instead of textbooks this time. And one of the uniting features are we have a very robust transfer system in British Columbia. Uh, and one of the features of the, of the new collection is that the metadata will include the transfer agreements. So if you're teaching a course at one institution in British Columbia that transfers to another course at an institution in British Columbia, you have the same learning outcomes. You don't both need to develop curriculum. And so we're, we're building courses that can be used across the system as shared curriculum. And then once it gets into the institutions with individual instructors, they can make some modifications to that because they're openly licensed. And so I think that um, that ability to collaborate on curriculum. Uh, we've also seen and, and again have had NBC for a number of years, an organization that um, provides uh, shared service licensing for educational technologies. We don't see uh, as much of that around um, open technologies. We do have, and we've got Tannis Morgan on the line here, and, and Anne-Marie is well aware of the open education um, technology group that uh, does collaborations here um, and, uh, and, and enables uh, folks to use open technologies um, so that um, so that they don't have to go to these big proprietary systems. Um, and so that's that's a service that we're trying to make more robust here, here in British Columbia and enable more of that. But I, I think that collaboration piece, um, again, using policy to, to drive the culture of collaboration, we're seeing that happening more and more in British Columbia. And again, that even just saying to an educator, you need to find out what other courses is your course transfers to in this system to get a grant from us opens up their world to what else is happening around them that they might also benefit from and so i think that's the where where we want to go with policy um, at a provincial level certainly is around more collaboration great thank you very much i am fascinated about the idea of uh, developing curricula that can be shared um, uh, you know, rather than, um, I guess, more granular open educational resources. And I think, um, yeah, I'd love to ask about that, but I'm, I'm kind of conscious of time and uh, uh, other things we need to get through. So I'll, I'll, maybe, um, I'll maybe drop your line separately and find out a bit more about that. Um, before we move on, uh, we've got a little bit of time left to explore the sort of international context, which we've started to unpick anyway. Um, so I guess we'll just be exploring any additional points in that area. I just wondered whether um, Ian wanted to respond to Karen's question um, around what could be visionary, equitable, and useful ways of using algor algorithms to guide the digital education policy provision. Because uh, I think that may have been in response to at least some of the points you raised, Ian. So would you like to come in here? Yeah, sure. Just briefly to amplify, and I, I don't have an answer to the question, although I think answers will emerge. I think what we need to do at the moment is make sure, as, as Angela explained yesterday afternoon, the fact of intrinsic algorithmic bias, the fact that algorithms point backwards, uh, and frequently point at prejudice and are written by humans who may be biased. Um, but I, I think it's also very clear that we, we have to spread a deeper understanding of that. There's no expectation that everyone understands the algorithm, but sometimes it's possible to explain their impact better in the forms of, in, in terms of concrete impact. The Oxford Internet Institute have got some very interesting material on what they call counterfactuals, which deal with the practical impact of algorithm algorithmic deployment. 
And in a sense, the, the, the UK or England at least has just seen a, a, a very good counterfactual example in the A-level uh, results fiasco that, that I mentioned earlier. Um, but I think there's a lot to explore there. And I, I think also that meaningful interrogation of algorithms doesn't just require open algorithms, but potentially open test data sets. Uh, and that's one reason why I think it's particularly important that we engage our colleagues in computer science at the moment. I have a link to some of the Oxford Inter Internet Institute stuff, which I'll, uh, I'll paste into the, uh, into the chat. There you go, if anybody's interested. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, and I think at this point, um, uh, I can just thank Karen for the question as well, which has uh, generated a lot of uh, discussion and thought there. Um, I think at this point in the remaining uh, time we've got, we will move on to explore international dimensions. Uh, and just to remind colleagues of the overarching question that we're exploring in this panel session. Uh, our overarching question is how could the experiences and lessons learned from the pandemic so far usefully change policies to ensure a better post-secondary education system. So in the time remaining, we're going to move on to explore that question in relation to the international context. Uh, and um, we were asking Ian to lead us off on this particular one. So it's back to you, Ian, for any responses at the international level. And I know we've started to explore and, and share some examples, but anything else you might like to say in this area? Sure. I mean, I, I think that looking at the, the kind of patchwork in, of, of provision internationally is a useful learning experience and it's a useful source of models uh, in the area that I work in, particularly around open source software to support learning, teaching and research. We've got a strong partnership with a consortium of universities in France, which represent about 80% of French higher ed. And it's such a different model from where I live in the UK. They're developing shared or mutualized services around open source code as platforms for innovation and for, for service delivery. Uh, and it sometimes I think is a, a very good thing for those of us who live in the, the Anglo-Saxon world to look at these other experiences and attempt to learn and generalize from them. But, but that's all about, I, I'd like to say at this point, Keith. Great, thank you, Ian. Um, uh, and Anne-Marie, can we invite you to share any additional thoughts you've got around the international dimensions to what we're exploring here today. Sure, absolutely. I'd, I'd like to um, echo Ian's point really strongly that um, we need to break out of our Anglophone bubble a little bit. There are other ways to do things and I think we tend to, you know, look to Australia, New Zealand, North America, the UK, we stick with the language family. It's easy to do that, I understand, but there are other ways of doing things and some of the the agendas that we don't particularly enjoy don't exist in other countries. So um, it, I think taking a more international perspective and getting out of that Anglophone bubble is incredibly important. Um, but the the other um, the other point I think is we can't avoid the fact that higher education policy and post secondary education policy is intrinsically bound up with immigration policy. We saw that in the UK over the last few years where um, UK institutions um, were generously given monitor requirements for international students and, and arguably became an outpost of border control in some ways. Um, what we've seen with the, um, the impacts on international students, um, I think I'm sure most people will have seen what went on in the US where um, there was a very strong line taken against international students who were studying, who were located in country, but were going to be studying online. At that point, their visas were going to be null and void and they would be ejected from the country. So we have been, as a, as a sector, we have been very keen to internationalise. We see having a, a vibrant international student community as a positive. Um, I think we have also relied on international students as a source of income. And so when when we come into this direct conflict with border control, there is a very, you know, it, it lays bare that intersection very, very strongly. So I think there's going to be some interesting conversations unfold about in, international students and um, reliance on international <coughs> students, the benefit of an international student community, um, which are going to be interesting and uh, probably quite challenging in some ways. 
Thank you, Anne-Marie. And um, uh, having been at um, almost all of the event the last two days, but needed to step out this morning to go to a meeting that partly covered um, Tier 4 visa um, uh, policy um, and expectations for international students um, to be able to study and be seen on campus, um, which post-COVID is an impossibility, um, then what you're saying uh, resonates very strongly with me, and I'm sure it will with other colleagues as well. Um, and I think also the point around um, where policies may cancel one another out. So we could have very kind of progressive, ethical, inclusive educational policy around learning and teaching. Um, but as you say, that, that is going to rub against national policy around um, uh, immigration. So huge, huge uh, issues to be challenge, uh, challenges to be addressed there, I think. Um, Mary, um, you're due next to give your thoughts on the international dimension. And again, I know we've, we've covered a few things already, but is there anything additional you'd like to add on the international dimension? Yeah, I think um, the international student issue has really been an interesting one because as Anne-Marie says, we've really been taking advantage of them and their desire to study here in order to take large sums of money up from them to support our institutions. Um, hi, tell it like it is, how about? <laughs> Um, what I wanted to say, and, and again, this will probably come as no surprise to you, but I think one of the things that um, from an international perspective that this has again highlighted is that those of us um, in a Western context, in a colonial context, have seen ourselves as the one to bring innovations to others um, in our savior mindset. And I think we can, we can think differently about those relationships and think of them as more reciprocal um, because we're, we're working with folks in other jurisdictions, countries, where they have been disadvantaged by the ways in which we do Western colonial education. And so they've innovated in order to uh, manage those challenges that, that they've um, encountered. And we can learn from those innovations. We can learn from the ways in which they have solved the problems that we've created for them. Um, so I think that's sort of where I would land on the international front, aside from um, more, um, more sharing, more learning about each other, more finding out what each other needs and uh, and helping each other in that way. Great, thank you very much, Mary. And um, uh, we'll, we'll turn um, lastly to Laura for any additional thoughts on the international dimension that you'd like to share with us. Um, yeah, so the thing that's been on my mind uh, around these international issues is the way that surveillance capitalism is um, getting entrenched during this period. And we unfortunately are so busy, we don't have time to pay attention to the antitrust hearings that are going on, for example, in the US, which have incredibly important implications for us. Because if you look at the number of companies that um, Alphabet has been acquiring and investing in and the complex data systems that they are um, embedding higher education into, it's really worrying. And I was listening to a podcast and I'm going to share it in the chat where we're starting to see with um, Google searches, for example, is that Google is now sending a, an increasing number of search results to its own products. So on average, nearly half of the first page of results from a Google search directed the user to Google products 41% of the time, 63% of the time on different types of devices. I'll, send, I'll show you the link. So this is really scary for search and education because obviously it's through search that knowledge is found and materialized and reenacted. So that, this is really worrying me in terms of the international policy framework. And then In the case kind of outside of our sphere is, is global trade agreements. I think we, re, we really do need people who can move between the spheres of global trade agreements and um, higher education to keep a look out for this marketization that's happening because it's actually removing the rights of governments to protect local people and the public mission of education, which we understand to be public good. So those are the two areas I'd like to mention, particularly in the public sphere, and that's actually quite depressing. Um, 
I was struggling to think of something positive to say here and the only thing I could think of was that there is some work being done around um, measure metrics around uh, social justice and the SDGs. So I started trying to think of what would a metrics for a social justice rubric look like. I don't know the answer, but I was trying to kind of think about it in a different way. So I think I'll leave it at that. And I'll share those Great, links. Thank you. Thank you. That would be very useful. I think we'd all appreciate that. Um, and certainly um, uh, much of what you're saying is resonating with comments in the chat area, particularly around capitalism. Um, and I think, I think you know, there's, there's a harsh reality here that uh, everything we're discussing does sit within um, wider um, international and global economic and political context that, that we, we need to challenge and uh, seek to change as well. Um, colleagues, I'm conscious that we're into the last five minutes. I'm just going to pause to see if anyone would like to take the mic to ask a direct question to the panel. And if you would, please click on the raise hand icon. And at the same time, uh, I will ask the panel whether there have been any points within the, the chat room over the last few minutes um, that you'd like to maybe just acknowledge or pick up on in particular um, in our last few minutes. Um, and saying as no one's picking up the mic, um, why don't we just move to that? So um, Anne-Marie, um, any final thoughts or, uh, or observations from yourself, um, either on what we've discussed or things you've seen in the uh, raised in the chat area? Um, yeah, lots of thoughts. It's <laughs> difficult trying to focus them down. I think one of the points that Mary, Mary and Ian made in different contexts, which will um, get outside of our bubbles, look for the answers to our problems in a diverse range of places, get rid of this, you know, savior mindset. There's a lot we can learn. Um, heck, it might even involve having to speak another language. Would that be a wonderful thing? Um, but but more more than that, when we think about if I think about um, maybe they think about the conference as a whole, and it, it's come up a little bit in this conversation. But I think there's been a really strong thread around care and trust, and we talk a lot about learner agency in institutions that's splattered across policies everywhere. I, I defy anybody to find a policy in their institution that doesn't have the word learner. Have, there'll be one in every institution that has the word learner, or the phrase of learner agency in it. Um, but how, how can we really give learners agency if we don't trust them, if we don't focus on their, their circumstances, if we don't provide them with flexibility, if we don't care for them, and we don't think about these equity issues? So, um, I mean, the, uh, everything we've just uh, discussed today, I think, speaks to that. But everything I've seen throughout the whole summit, I think, really comes back to if we if we're genuine and serious about learner agency, then all of these pieces come into play. Great, thank you. And I'm conscious, you know, that yeah, the, the last two days has brought to the surface so many things we need to be thinking about and making connections between. Um, I can move to Mary. Mary, can I ask you if you've got any brief concluding comments or observations you'd like to offer? Yeah, not a lot, but I just would say this is about people. This is about individual people and relationships. And I think let's stay worked up about this. And let's, as, as we go back into our lives, once we're done with this pandemic stuff, which maybe we're never going to be done with it, um, but let's continue think of each other as people, as individuals, and build on those relationships. And um, and let's stay angry about the stuff that's wrong, and that will drive us to do something else. Thank you very much. I think uh, staying angry is a, a very good message um, to be sharing as we come towards the end of, uh, of the event. Um, Laura and then Ian um, can invite you to share any final thoughts or observations before we conclude. Um, I'll go to you yeah, first, I just, Laura. I just, I just posted a quote from one of my favourite Canadians in the chat, which is about the cracks being where the light comes in, and really, it's about finding the the moments of possibility. I don't go for this blind optimism, and you know, if we're all happy, clappy, and, and mindful, everything will be okay. I don't think that's useful. That kind of positive thinking. I do think that. Um, Identif finding those cracks where the light comes in and identifying the moments of possibility is is what we can do. And, and that's what I'm going for. 
staying angry and and you know, finding those kind of moments of light i think um yeah uh, fantastic um finally ian any any concluding thoughts you'd just like to offer before we come to the end of the session no i mean i think we or few anyway we came to the, the point of discussing the issue of surveillance capitalism platforms and their impact on education i think the alt community and communities like it around the world have done a very good job of, of keeping the torch high for, for open education. I think as well as staying angry, we need to stay networked and we need to make sure that we find like-minded in, in individuals and institutions elsewhere in the world and making darn sure that we, we network our practice and information to them. Great, thank you very much, Ian. And um, I'll share one of on just as uh, uh, on the theme of anger. Um, one of my favourite kind of quotes from uh, John Lydon when he was in the Sex Pistols: "Anger is an energy." And I'd add to that that shared anger is an even greater energy. Um, uh, so yeah, um, perhaps we can generate some shared anger around all of this. So colleagues, we've come to six o'clock. Um, I'm conscious that in exploring policy post-COVID and exploring in institutional, national, and international dimensions. All we can really do in an hour is skit along the surface, but I think we've raised um, a number of really interesting points. Um, uh, thanks to colleagues in the chat room who have shared various things, including resources. Um, and I think we'll go away with uh, a lot to think about, both from this panel and the last two days um, uh, as an event. So I think it's been fantastic. Um, could we show appreciation as we're starting to do to our uh, speakers in the uh, chat area, please? And thanks for everyone that um, uh, was here to, uh, for the final session. I think we've appreciated the, the levels of uh, engagement and the ideas being shared. So, sorry, um, Marin, with that, I'm, I'm handing back to you. Thank you very much, Keith, and thanks from everyone to Keith for chairing this final concluding discussion so eloquently. Um, thank you Keith for really teasing out those important issues. Um, before we wave you goodbye and wish you a safe journey back to your kitchens or living rooms or possibly even a different part of the um, place you're in altogether, um, we'd just like to ask you um, for a few questions or feedback um, if you want to stay. Um, and we also want to say thanks to all the individuals and organizations that have helped make the summit happen. So I'm going to ask my colleague